All right, so uh, left, you know, if that's the case. Huh? Yeah, no, I figured I like to read, and uh, I keep, I'm cooped up in that damn house. Uh, so I figured what would be a better topic? I, I'm i getting really bored with the nuts and bolts. And I want to talk about Autodesk, Revit MEP systems. I digressed over to uh, pediatrics. Uh, I'm all over the place. But I've been to zoos. And I thought maybe a good idea would be to talk about this, because, you know, we're all getting older. So uh, how would we uh, outsmart dementia before it uh, gets a hold of us? So I, I was going to read verbatim as the, uh, from the latest tools for controlling cognitive health, preventing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So the table of contents reads like this, uh, 04 introduction, 12 how the brain works, 24, improvement memory, 54, 70, exercise, 78, sleep. What is dementia? Dementia is an umbrella term used to describe a group of brain disorders characterized by the loss of cognitive functioning, thinking, remembering, and reasoning, and behavioral abilities that impairs a person's ability to perform everyday activities. Some people with dementia can't control their emotions and their personalities may change. Symptoms of dementia occur when nerve cells called neurons in the brain deteriorate and die. Everyone loses some neurons as they age, but people with dementia experience further the loss. While dementia is more common in older adults, it is not a normal part of aging. Unlike dementia, age-related memory loss is not disabling. Dementia ranges in severity from the early, mildest stage when it is just beginning to affect a person's functioning to the latest, most severe stage when a person must rely on others for help with all tasks of daily living. Signs and symptoms. Forgetfulness is often the first symptoms of dementia. Dementia also causes problems with the ability to think, reason, and solve problems. For example, a person with dementia may get lost in a familiar neighborhood, forget the name of a close family member, have trouble following a familiar recipe, or keeping track of monthly bills, uh, using correct words to refer to familiar objects, forget recently learned information, and need to help with tasks they once handled on their own. Some people with dementia exhibit personality changes, depression, anxiety, agitation, paranoia, irritability, inappropriate behavior. Certain types of dementia can also cause issues with movement and balance. The types of dementia, page five. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. It accounts for 68% of all dementia cases. Alzheimer's is a chronic neurodegenerative disease, or I should say, maybe I'm slipping a little. Alzheimer's is a chronic neurodegenerative disorder that results in progressive memory loss impaired thinking, disorientation, and changes in personality and mood. Eventually, Alzheimer's destroys the ability to carry out simple tasks. Alzheimer's disease is currently the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and may rank third as a cause of death for older people. The disease is named for Dr. Aloy Alzheimer, a German doctor who, during an autopsy in 1906, discovered the physical changes in the brain of a woman who had died of a strange mental illness. He found plaques and tangles in her brain. Signs that are now considered features of Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's, also called the younger onset Alzheimer's, is a relatively rare form of dementia that strikes people under the age of 65. Most people with early onset Alzheimer's develop symptoms in their 40s and 50s. It is estimated that roughly 200,000 Americans suffer from early Alzheimer's disease. Symptoms are the same as the senior disease. They are just exhibited at an earlier age. Alzheimer's warning signs. Memory loss that disrupts daily life. A common early sign of Alzheimer's is forgetting recently learned information. Others include forgetting important dates or events, asking the same questions repeatedly, and increasingly relying on memory aids or family members for things they used to handle on their own. Planning or problem solving changes. Some people with dementia may experience changes in their ability to develop and follow plan or work with numbers. They may have difficulty following a familiar recipe or keeping track of monthly bills. They may have trouble concentrating and take much longer to do things than they did before. Difficulty completing familiar tasks. People living with Alzheimer's often find it hard to complete daily tasks. 
Sometimes they may have trouble driving to a familiar location, organizing grocery lists, or remembering the rules of a favorite game. Confusion with time or place. People with Alzheimer's can lose track of dates, seasons, and the passage of time. They may have trouble understanding something if it is not happening immediately. Sometimes they may forget where they are or how they got there. New problems with words in speaking or writing. Now, I'm by the tennis courts in Bayonne. The Ronix the Pony League and Crossing the Kill Van Cole and Faber University is right across the way. New problems with words in speaking or writing. People with Alzheimer's may have a trouble following or joining a conversation. They may stop in the middle of a conversation. They have no idea how to continue or they may repeat themselves. They may have uh, struggling issues with vocabulary, have trouble naming a familiar object, or use the wrong name. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. For some people, having vision problems is a sign of Alzheimer's. This may lead to difficulty with balance or trouble reading. They may also have problems judging distance and determining color or contrast, causing driving issues. Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. People with Alzheimer's disease may put things in unusual places. They may lose things and be unable to go back over their steps to find them again. They may accuse others of stealing, especially as the disease, disease progresses. Decreased or poor judgment. Individuals may experience changes in judgments or decision making. For example, they may use poor judgment when dealing with money or pay less attention to personal hygiene. Withdrawal from work or social activities. A person with Alzheimer's may experience changes in the ability to hold or follow a conversation. As a result, they may withdraw from hobbies, social activities, or other engagements. The smoking plays into this. Mood and personality changes. Individuals living with Alzheimer's may become confused, suspicious, depressed, fearful, anxious. They may be easily upset at home with friends or when out of their comfort zone. Or in hostile work environments. Or environmental environments. Hostile environmental environments. Departments, environments. You know, same thing. Vascular dementia. Vascular dementia, the second most common cause of dementia, is instigated by reduced or blocked blood flow to the brain. Common symptoms include confusion, memory problems, unsteady gait, trouble controlling urination, and needing to urinate frequently, slow thinking, and difficulties with problem solving, focus, and organization. Symptoms can occur suddenly after a major stroke or begin as mild changes that gradually worsen as a result of multiple minor strokes. Vascular dementia can also result, result from other conditions that damage blood vessels and reduce circulation. Frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is a group of disorders caused by the degenerative degeneration of nerve cells in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. These areas control personality, behavior, and language. Symptoms of frontotemporal dementia can vary depending on which part of the brain is affected. Some people experience dramatic behavioral and personality changes that may include uncharacteristic impulsiveness, inappropriate social conduct, emotional indifference, poor financial improvement, a decline in personal hygiene, or overeating. Others experience speech and language problems. Frontal temporal disorders are more common in middle-aged adults than in seniors. And children can get early onsets of this because of stressors in their environment and in their caregivers. Uh, an abused child uh, can suffer similar effects, twisting of the nerve cells. Lewy body dimension. Lewy bodies are abnormal deposits of a protein called alpha synuclein found in the brains of people with Lewy body dementia. Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. These deposits impact thinking, movement, behavior, and mood. People with lowly body dementia may experience visual hallucinations, sleep difficulties, and problem with focus and attention. Other signs of lowly body dementia include Parkinson's disease-like disease -like symptoms, such as rigid muscles, uncoordinated or slow movement, and tremors. Mixed dementia. People with mixed dementia, and, and apologize, I'm in my uh, Twitter scion. People with mixed dementia have a combination of two or more types of dementia occurring simultaneously. The most common combination is Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Autopsy studies of the brains of people aged 80 and up who had dementia indicate that many had a combination of causes such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and Lewy body dementia. That was out, uh, smart dementia, 89. 
preventing dementia. Unfortunately, and this is sad, unfortunately, miracle cures for dementia. The good news is that adopting a healthy lifestyle can help reduce your risk of develop, developing dementia. It can also help prevent cardiovascular diseases such as stroke and heart attack, which are themselves risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Keep cognitively fit. Mentally stimulating activities such as reading, solving puzzles, and playing games might delay the onset of dementia and decrease its effects. The more vigorous and diverse your mental life, the more you will stimulate the growth of new neurons and new connections between neurons. You may find many tips. Co-sharing health beginning on page 24. And we're on page 10, Outsmart, Outsmart Dementia. Eating a healthy diet. Research shows that those who eat an unhealthy diet have an increased risk of dementia. Nutri nutritionists recommend a diet rich in fish, fresh vegetables and fruit, whole grains, nuts, and, and I have never been able to pronounce this word. The legumes, legumes? I don't know how to pronounce it. Legumes? I don't know how to pronounce it. Find more discussion on di of diets starting on page 54. Physical activity can help prevent the onset of dementia and slow its progression in those already exhibiting symptoms. Aim for 30 uh, minutes of moderate exercise three or more days per week. Discover exercise tips beginning on page 70. Manage cardiovascular risk factors including high blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol, buildup of fats and artery walls, arterial sclerosis, and obesity. Research has shown that what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. Quit smoking. I know, I know, I know. Let's see. Let's see. We're going to have to see. Quit smoking. The Surgeon General is telling you that. Quit smoking. And I'm not him or her. However, smoking cessation. Quit smoking. Smoking may increase your risk of developing dementia and blood vesicle vascular disease. Smoking causes arteries to narrow. Which can raise blood pressure. Quitting will improve health and well-being while lowering dementia risk. Numbers don't lie. Be social. Maintaining an active social life may reduce dementia risk. Connect with others through clubs or classes. Sleep. Getting seven to nine hours of quality sleep per night may help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease or slow the symptoms. But my father told me, you know, they would judge distance by sleeps. And sometimes it takes 10 sleeps to get somewhere. So, it's a peace pipe, right? It's just a peace pipe. Why is everyone getting in such a hassle over it? Tussle. It's a peace pipe. Be social. Maintain an active social life may reduce dementia risk. Connect with others through clubs or classes. Sleep. Getting seven to nine hours of quality sleep per night may help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease or slow the symptoms. Get screened for sleep apnea if you snore loudly, which I do. Or have periods when you stop breathing or gas while sleeping and that can happen. Find more tips on sleep starting on page 78. Get your vitamins. Low levels of vitamin D, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and folate may increase dementia risk. It's best to get your vitamins through a varied diet of healthy foods rather than through supplements. Dementia risk factors, age, family history, high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, heavy alcohol use, depression, low education levels. And that's tantamount when it comes to my family getting them more you know, pushed forward in the uh, educational system. They were chipped. They were shortchanged. The whole 9-11 generation was fucked and screwed from the gecko. How the brain works. 
how the brain works. Human memory is a complex brain-wide process that is essential to who we are. The more you know about your brain and the way memory works, you, the more you'll understand how to improve it. In this chapter, we'll discuss how memory works and how aging affects your ability to remember. Remembering, remembering how memory works, two times. Your baby's first cry, the taste of your grandmother's molasses cookies, the scent of an ocean breeze. These are memories that make up the ongoing experience of your life. They're what make you feel comfortable with familiar people and surroundings. Tie your past with your present and provide a framework for your future in a profound way. It is our collective set of memories, our memory as a whole, that makes us who we are. Most people, most that is, talk about memory as if it were a thing to, they have, like bad eyes or a good head of hair. But your memory doesn't exist in the way a part of your body exists. It's not a thing you can touch. It's a concept that refers to the process of remembering. In the past, many experts were fond of describing memory as a sort of tiny filing cabinet full of individual memory folders in which information is stored away. Unlike uh, others, like in memory to a neural supercomputer wedged under the human scalp. But today, <laughs> experts believe, and I'm not one of them, that memory is far more complex and elusive than that, and that it is located not in one particular place in the brain, but instead a brain-wide process like cloud computing. Do you remember what you had for breakfast this morning? If the image of a big plate of fried eggs and bacon popped into your mind, you didn't dredge it up from some out-of-the-way neural alleyway. Instead, that memory was a result of an incredibly complex constructed power one that each of us possesses that reassemble disparate memory impressions from the web-like pattern of cells scattered throughout the brain. Your memory is really made up of a group of systems that each plays a different role in creating, storing, and recalling your memories. But when the brain processes information normally, all of these different systems work together perfectly to provide cohesive thought. What seems to be a single memory is actually a complex construction. If you think of a pen, your brain retrieves the object's name, its shape, its function, perhaps even the sound that makes when it scratches the page. Each part of the memory of a pen comes from a different region of the brain. The entire image of a pen is actively reconstructed by the brain from many different areas. Neural, uh, neurologists are only beginning to understand how the parts are reassembled into a coherent whole. If you're riding a bike, the memory of how to operate that bike comes from one set of brain cells. The memory of how to get from here to the end of a block comes from another. The memory of biking, the memory of biking, well they say if you fall off, get back on. The memory of biking safety rules from another and that, excuse me, I gotta hit this cancer stick. And that, the nervous feeling you get when a car veers dangerously close from still another. Yet you, you're never aware that these are separate mental experiences, nor that they're coming from all different parts of your brain because they all work together so well. In fact, experts tell us there is no firm distinction between how you remember and how you think. That's what the book says. This doesn't mean that scientists have figured out exactly how the system works. They still don't fully understand exactly how you remember what occurs during recall. The search of how the brain organizes memories and where those memories are acquired with stories been a never-ending quest among brain researchers for decades, still there is enough information to make some educated guesses. The process of memory begins with encoding, then proceeds to storage and eventually moves to retrieval. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are more fucking cars buzzing around this field right now than you can shake a stick at. And it's never this busy when there's nobody around. Encoding. Encoding is the first step in creating memory. It's a biological phenomenon rooted in the senses that begin begins with perception. Consider, for example, the memory of the first person you ever fell in love with. And for, can anyone? I can't. Still, no such thing. <laughs> it doesn't exist. When you meet that person, your visual system likely registered physical features such as their eye 
and hair color, your auditory system may have picked up the sound of their laugh. I heard dog barking. You probably noticed the scent of their perfume or cologne. You may even have felt the touch of their hand. Each of these separate sensations traveled to the part of your brain called the hippocampus, which integrated these perceptions as they were occurring into one single experience. Your experience of that specific person. Ah, who's that guy? <laughs> Experts believe that the hippocampus, along with the frontal cortex, is responsible for analyzing these various sensory inputs and deciding if they're worth remembering. If they are, they may become part of your long term memory. As indicated earlier, these various bits of information are then stored in different parts of the brain. How these bits are retrieved, excuse me, are later identified and retrieved to form a cohesive memory, however, it is not yet known. Although a memory begins with perception, it is encoded and stored by nerve cells using the language of electricity and chemicals. The connections between nerve cells and the brain aren't set in stone, they change all the time. <laughs> brain cells work together in a network, organizing themselves into groups that specialize in different kinds of information processing. As one brain sends, well it says, as one brain cell sends, signals to another, the synapse between the two gets stronger. The more signals sent between them, the stronger the connection goes. Thus, with each new experience, your brain slightly rewires its physical structure. In fact, how you use your brain helps determine how your brain is organized. It is plasticity that can help your brain rewire itself even if it is ever damaged. Plastic man, Stretch Armstrong. As you learn and experience the world and changes occur at the synapses and dendrites, more connections in your brain are created. The brain organizes and reorganizes itself in response to those motherfuckers at ADCO that kept fucking pushing my motherfucking buttons. Sorry, uh, the brain organizes itself and reorganizes itself in response to your experiences, forming memories triggered by the effects of outside input prompted by experience, education, or training, or just the lack of education. You can have external stimulus coming from bodies around you that are, are their only intent is to, you know, lobotomize you. So I'm not even going to go there. That <laughs> maybe, hold on, let me, let me scroll down a little. Let me scroll down. All right, so anyway, that was a bad experience. I pulled that out of my read-only memory. These changes are reinforced with you so that as you learn and practice the information, intricate circuits of knowledge and memory are built into the brain. If you play a piece of music over and over, for example, and they do, for example, the repeated firing of certain cells in a certain order in your brain makes it easier to repeat this firing later on. The result, you get better at playing the music. You can play it faster with fewer mistakes, practice it long enough, and you will play it. Let's not say perfect. Let's not say the perfect pitch. Come on. It's a collective effort. Yet, if you stop practicing for several weeks, somebody else is going to play it perf perfectly. And then try to play the piece. You may notice that the result is no longer perfect. Your brain has already begun to forget what you once knew so well. To properly encode a memory, you must first be paying attention. Since you cannot pay attention to everything all the time, most of what you encounter every day is simply filtered out. And only a few stimuli pass into your conscious awareness. If you remember every single thing that you notice, your memory will be full before you even left the house in the morning or in the evening or the time you leave the house. But do we ever really leave the house? They said the house never loses. What scientists aren't sure about is whether stimuli are screened out during the sensory input stage or only after the brain processes significance. What we do know is that how you pay attention to information may be the most important factor in how much of it you actually remember. Easier encoding. If you want to remember a word, thinking about how it sounds or its meaning will help. Likewise, if you use visual imagery to help memorize something, such as meeting a person named Mr. Bell, and thinking of a bell when you shake hands, you're more likely to remember it. Some experts believe that using imagery helps you remember it because it provides a second kind of memory encoding and two codes are better than one. That was Outsmarting Dementia, page 17. 
memory storage. That's how the brain works. And this is page 18. I'll start about smart dementia. 18. Memory storage. Once the memory is created, it must be stored no matter how briefly. Um, and many experts think there are three ways. I think there are more. I think there are more. Because not all experts think there are three ways. We as a unit still memories. First, in the sensory stage, they need short term memory. And ultimately, it's some of us. And ultimately, for some memories, long term memory. I want a dandy comb. I want a dandy comb. Colored sprinkles. And ultimately, for some memories, in long term memory, because there's no need for us to maintain everything in our brain. The different stages of human memory function as a sort of filter that helps protect us from the flood of information that we're confronted with on a daily basis. Sensory information, or sensory memory. The creation of a memory begins with its perception. The registration of information during perception occurs in the brief sensory stage that usually lasts only a fraction of a second. It's your sensory memory that allows a perception such as a visual pattern, sound, or touch to linger for a brief moment after the stimulation is over. Now, we've all had encounters like, hey, uh, where we've been stimulated, right? Haven't we? Haven't we all had count, uh, encounters like that where we've been uh, had moments of stimulation? And, and that's where, you know, utilizing the tools that you have can help you to understand what it is that we're talking about here. Because the brain is one of the most important organs in the body. And if you're a deviating from center, or if somebody or some group of individuals are trying to make you deviate from center, then, then, then you're going to lose that a uh, visual pattern, a uh, sound, or a touch to linger for a brief moment after the, the stimulation is over. And, and that may be something that you don't want to happen. Uh, your uh, precious moments. So, short-term memory. After that first flicker, the sensation is stored in short-term memory. Short-term memory has a fairly limited capacity. It can hold about seven items for no more than 20 or 30 seconds at a time. You may be able to increase this capacity somewhat by using various memory strategies. For example, a 10-digit number may be too much for your short-term memory to hold, but L0516-5047-109684, that's my uh, DL. But dividing into chunks as in a telephone number, it may actually stay in your short-term memory long enough for you to dial the telephone. Likewise, by repeating the number to yourself, you can keep resetting the short-term memory clock. Long-term memory. Important information is gradually transferred from short-term into long-term memory. The more you repeat or use the information, the more likely it is to eventually end up in long-term memory or to be or be retained. To be or not to be? What is the question? Now, this here is uh, something that uh, we should pay attention to. Because this is uh, Outsmart Dementia, page 19. And this was happening to my children. But they're showing an old man doing, getting it happened to him. This was happening to my father, my sister, my whole family. This was happening to me. You can sum that up in my entire family. What was happening to them? I, I'm sure I'm not alone. But that was happening to my family. The who or why is unbeknownst to me, but Alice does that. Alice does that too. It advances it really quick for them. On purpose, sometimes. Now, let's not. Let's not use that portion of our brain that wants us to behave in a predatory way, right? You're, when you're defending your loved ones, you want to behave in a predatory um, way. You know, like all those video games. So, long-term memory, important information is gradually transferred from short-term memory into long-term memory. The more that you repeat or use the information, more likely it is to eventually end up in long-term memory and be retained. That is why studying helps people to perform better on tests. Unlike sensory and short-term memory, which are limited and decay rapidly, long-term memory can store a new information indefinitely. 
People tend to more easily store material on subjects they already know, since the information has more meaning to them and can be mentally connected to related information that's already stored in their long-term memory. That's why someone who has an average memory may be able to remember a great depth of information about one particular subject. Most people think of long-term memory when they think of memory itself, but most experts believe information must first pass through sensory and short-term memory before it can be stored as long-term. How the brain works, page 20, types of remembering. Psychologists have identified four types of remembering. Recall, this is what you often think of as remembering, the active, unaided remembering of something from the past. This is the reconstruction of events or of facts on the basis of particular cues which serve as reminders. Recognition. All quiet on the western front. This is the ability to correctly identify previously encountered stimuli, such as when you see your old teacher's face across the room and recognize who she or he is. Relearning. This type of remembering is a testament to the power of the memory itself. Material that's familiar to you is often easier to learn a second time. Memory retrieval. When you want to remember something, you retrieve the information on an unconscious level, bringing it into your conscious mind at will. While most people think they have either a bad or good memory, in fact, most people are fairly good at remembering some things and not good at remembering others. If you do have trouble remembering something, assuming you don't have a physical disease, it's usually not the fault of your entire memory system, but an inefficient component of one part of your memory system. Let's look at how you remember where you put your eyeglasses. Prior to this, there, I, I couldn't find them. I left them in the T-Mobile phone bag. Let's look at how you remember where you put your sunglasses. They're on my face. I prefer a different style, but it is what it is. They're not very flattering. Let's look at how you remember where you put your sunglasses. When you go to bed at night, you must register where you put your eyeglasses. You must pay attention while you set them on your bedside table. You must be aware of where you're putting them or you won't be able to remember their location the following morning. Next, this information is retained. Ready to be retrieved at a later time. If the system is working properly when you wake up in the morning, you will remember exactly where you left your eyeglasses. If you've forgotten where they are, you may have not registered clearly where you put them, or you may not have retained what you registered, or you may not be able to retrieve the memory accurately. Therefore, if you want to stop forgetting where you left your eyeglasses, you will have to work on making sure that there are three stages of the remembering process that need to be working correctly. If you forgot something, it may be because you didn't encode it very effectively, because you were distracted while encoding, should have taken place, or because you're having trouble retrieving it. If you've forgotten where you put your eyeglasses, you may not have really forgotten it at all. Instead, the location may never have gotten into your memory in the first place. And we, know how, we all know how that could happen. Distractions that occur while you're trying to remember something can really get in the way of encoding memories. Excuse me. I can't record with the AC on, so I have to uh, sweat a little. Yeah, these distractions, while you're trying to remember something, can really get away from coding memories. If, you, if you're trying to read a business report in a busy airport, you may think you're remembering what you read, but you may not have effectively saved it in your memory. That reminds me of a, a saying in the office. If, there, if uh, assholes were airplanes, this place would be an airport. The age gap. Research suggests that older people have some trouble with all three stages of memory, but they have special problems with registering and retrieving information. Finally, you may have forgot because you're simply having trouble retrieving the memory. 
If you've ever tried to remember something one time and couldn't, but then later you remember that same item, it could be that there was a mismatch between retrieval cues and the encoding of the information you were searching for. You'll be better able to remember something if you use a retrieval cue that occurred when you first formed the memory. If you memorize a poem on doors when birds are singing in the plane, bird song might help you recall a poem. This is why vivid memories will recur strongly when you experience the sensation that accompanies the original event. It's why, for example, the sound of a car pad fire the trigger one of the memory of a battlefield experience for someone who was previously in a war zone, the aging brain. As we age, our brains slowly lose mass, blood, flow, to the brain decreases. We also lose neurons, the nerve cells that make up most of the brain. Still, the news isn't all bad. While damaged or dead nerve cells in the brain cannot be replaced, research indicates that the brain can grow new neurons in the hippocampus, an area that plays an important role in learning and creating new memories. Research has begun to shed light on the types of physical changes that occur in the brain as a result of learning. For example, experiencing and learning lots of new things may increase. The development of new nerve cells in a region of the temporal lobe called the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. Let me just look over here to the lower left where my head is. Anyway, the number and size of synapses, the connections between nerve cells that are necessary for relaying, processing, and recalling information. The size and number of the digital <laughs> the glial cells that help to nourish and maintain the neurons in the brain and spinal cord. The amount of myelin insulation protection, protecting the axons of nerve cells, especially in the bundle of nerves that allows the right and left sides of the brain to communicate. The number of tiny blood vessels that supply certain areas of the brain. More of these vessels means more blood and oxygen can flow to these areas to nourish the nerve cells. These changes taken together highlight a very important feature of the brain known as plasticity. The way the brain is able to change as a result of experience. And it means that by exposing ourselves to new things and actively seeking more varied experiences, not just when we're young, but throughout our lives, we can maintain uh, even and even enhance the brain's mental resources and cognitive abilities. I'm sure that helps too. It expands your mind's around. As long as you stay active, interested in life, and engaged in the world around you, your memory and other cognitive abilities don't have to deteriorate as you grow older. Well, research shows that enriching your surroundings, daily experiences, and, and life as a whole can pay off in a sharper, more resilient mind. For example, animal studies have found that rats living in cages with plenty of exciting toys and lots of stimulation have larger, healthier brain cells and a larger outer brain layer. Deprived rats living in barren cages, on the other hand, have smaller brains. They tend to do that. They, they tend to, and, and, and they tend to flock together. They do. Deprived rats living in barren cages, on the other hand, have smaller brains. Well, they thought they were deprived. That's why they're living in barren cages. And they also thought they were entitled to things. And that's why, you know, they didn't realize that they had small brains to begin with. A, t a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Research in humans strongly indicates that stimulating the brain in a variety of ways throughout life can help to protect cognitive function. It also appears to provide a kind of mental reserve that helps to lay signs of normal brain aging as well as loss of cognitive function related to Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Like looting and trying to kill cops and shit like that, you know? <laughs> Things like that too, eh? It's everyone else's fault but yours. I'm sorry. What side of the brain did I use wrong? Hold on. I'm just telling you, man. I call him like I see him. I have an opinion on the matter. Let's talk about that one. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so stay active. Yeah, stay active. And again, rats, rats tend to, uh, hang out. Birds of a feather flock together. Research in humans strongly indicates that stimulating the brain in a variety of ways throughout life can help to protect cognitive function. It also appears to provide a kind of mental reserve that helps delay signs of normal brain aging as well as loss of cognitive function related to Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. 
What can you do to enrich your brain's environment? Get out and see new places, meet new people, and experience new things. In the pages ahead, you'll discover numerous, numerous ways to improve your memory. And try to stay away from teleport in Staten Island. Yeah, you vey. Minds Horizons. Play a board game. If you're like most of us, you probably have a few board games collecting dust somewhere. Chess, checkers, Monopoly, Scrabble, we've all played a game or two in our lives, but they often only see a lot of day during family get-togethers. The board games played at any age provide some surprising brain benefits. In fact, the very nature of many of these games is conducive to better brain function. After all, many games require good memory, problem-solving skills, and the ability to process complex situations. The more you play these games, the more you build up the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, the areas of the brain responsible for complex functions, like exercise for the brain, board games, results in a sharper memory, improved learning capacity, and better cognitive function. This increase in cognitive ability translates into a lower risk of brain disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, keeping your mind engaged with the challenges of games helps the brain form and retain memories and thoughts. And it even speeds up the time it takes to process these thoughts. And those aren't the only benefits from playing board games. They can also lower stress, lower blood pressure, and even strengthen the immune system. Time to dust off those neglected games. Visit a museum or gallery. The love of art is subjective, but no matter what kind of art you enjoy, one thing is certain, visiting a museum is greatly beneficial for your brain. Scientists have discovered that those who visit museums of art galleries or art galleries, even for as little as 30 minutes, show a decrease in the stress hormone cortisol and an increase in beneficial brain chemicals. And one study in which volunteers view art while neurologists, neurologists, sorry, I work in the city, scanning their brains. Researchers discovered that looking at art caused an increase in dopamine, the same chemical related to feelings of love. It also resulted in a 10% increase in blood flow to the brain, a phenomenon related to falling in love. Now that, my friend, is something that I can't help you with. Researchers, though, and uh, neurologists study the brain, and uh, they can tell the students uh, or control groups looking at images on art for 30 minutes um, show a decrease in the stress hormone cortisol. I go here. All, I go here all the time. Anyway, in one study, it happened. You know, I, I did the same thing. I did this that study all the time. It increase uh, increases dopamine. The same chemical related to the feelings of love. It also resulted in a ten percent increase in blood flow to the brain. A phenomenon related to falling in love. You can't blame gravity for love. It would seem that art and love are closely related, but viewing art does more than provide us with fuzzy, warm feelings. Wandering through a museum engages the brain in a complex activity as it takes in new sights and processes the information. While it does, it creates new neural connections, causing better communication between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. I got seven kids. I hope that they don't turn out like the dog that I was when I was a younger man. I guess having boys and girls will do that. Hold on, I gotta move the mouse. Anyway. Let's just take a peek, shall we? Take a breather. I'm reading this, uh, rattle it off like it's going out of style. That's cute, I like that one. I like that one. That's cute. Because they're getting older, you know, and if I can hear the grandfather clock it's ticking and talking. Now, 
the left and right hemispheres. You know, how, how much uh, your brain appreciates it. Right? Look at it from lots of different perspectives. Right? Images of the left. And silhouettes really are, are beautiful when you think about it. Look at silhouettes. All right, so let's just leave it like that for a second. All of this results in reduced stress, stronger critical thinking skills, and a better memory. In fact, people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease who frequently participate in visual arts activities often see great improvement in their symptoms. They have the money for it. But then again, the museums are actually free. They only request uh, a donation, a suggestion. While art itself may be subjective, the benefits that come from viewing it are certainly not. But I'll be honest, it really, really, sometimes, it works for me. It'll get you out of the office, you know, if that's your forte.